Well, I crossed the Pyrenees uh, last year. It was just after the, the Red Bull League Alps. I was fit and uh, I went, I think it was uh, in August, around 15th of August, something like that. And uh, it took me around two weeks. Well, I, I heard a lot about the Pyrenees uh, before. I've, I have never flown, flown there. I, I didn't know anything about the place. But uh, Ramon Morias was telling me that uh, he had been doing some bivouac there. And then uh, I heard the stories of uh, Inigo Gaviria and uh, Gaviria and, and all those guys that were flying there. And then when I saw the XP, I thought, this, this is a brilliant idea. Um, and, uh, and yeah, again, I, I thought it was just exactly the right length, you know, 400 and something kilometers so I thought okay let's just do it but I was on my own you know alone and um, without support so yeah it was it was quite an adventure but um, really cool actually really from from I had been thinking about it for a long time and uh, and uh, it was really it was a, I really had a great time well yeah I was uh, you know, my, my idea was to go from um, Andaribia to the other side, from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean Sea. And actually, basically, I thought the best way is to start from the, the lighthouse to the lighthouse. There's a lighthouse on the west and there's a lighthouse on the east. So that was pretty easy for me to say, okay, from the lighthouse to the lighthouse. And, um, and of course, I was looking at the track of the XP. Uh, because it's, it's the most logical one, basically. Uh, and I wanted to stay a bit more on the Spanish side because I speak Spanish and of course I also speak French but I speak Spanish and I thought oh, that's gonna be nice to meet some local people and you know culturally speaking I, I like Spain so this is why I stay on that side and you can on the way I was following the GR11 and GR10 which are two pretty famous uh, tracks on the way and uh, yeah that was that was really cool I mean um, the beauty the beauty of the Pyrenees is that it's way more wild than the Alps, actually. There's almost no roads and there's uh, very few vi villages. Not many people live there, so it's quite a good place to just get lost by yourself in the mountains and, you know, enjoy some time there. It's, uh, it's quite cool. The weather, I, um, the weather wasn't really good. I mean, um, I knew I had only two weeks, so... Um, I, I had to start, you know, I, at the beginning I thought, okay, I'm just going to wait for good weather and then try to cross it as fast as possible, fly as much as possible, but then the weather was not really good and I only had two weeks, after that I was going to another uh, another trip, another expedition, so basically I just asked my girlfriend to bring me to Andaribia and I started under the rain, I mean the first day was kind of okay, but there is no flying there, basically I was walking all the way to La Rune and then down to the little village at the bottom. And the next day was raining all day. Uh, I arrived in uh, Pico de Lori, I think, de Ori, I think, on the third day, which was quite fast. And the weather was not good and really stable then. For four or five days, I had very, very stable weather. So I was fighting to try to climb and take off and fly as much as possible, but um, it was pretty stable. So I had a lot of walking, but still, it was better to try to fly and land high in the mountain, you know, and fly very little small flights, you know, maybe I was flying 15Ks, 20Ks, you know, then land up, high up, and then climb back up to the mountain, try to keep on going like this. On long days, like when I had the best days, I flew maybe 60, 70 kilometers, but it took me three or four different flights. Um, so that's a, a technique that you should really use if you want to cross the Pyrenees, because it's not the same in the Alps. In the Alps, you can just go down in the valley and then start walking. Uh, from from east to west in the case of uh, of the Red Bull Alps, but here in the Pyrenees it's just like valleys after valleys. So you would just go up and down, up and down, up and down all the time. So the best way to do it is try to stay high in the mountains and of course fly as much as possible, which is not an easy task. And then I had some better weather. Then I went all the way to the Taga and from there walking again two days. You you have to expect that you have two days at the start more or less two days walking at the start and more or less one day and a half, two days walking at the end because it's basically flat, you know, it's difficult to fly there. So, yeah. But the weather was not the best and I, altogether I took, uh, I think, 12 days, so 13 days. Um, 
but I, I reckon you can do it with good weather. You can do it, of course, under a week, like the guys did it at the XP, maybe probably even in five days. Um, that would be really fast, but that's possible. And on really bad weather, you should do it under two weeks easily. I mean, it's a lot of walking, but still it's doable, of course. Ten days maybe, if you go really fast. Well, it was... Um, I really love the Pyrenees. Basically, it's it's really wild, you know. It's um, lots of little tracks. Even when you walk on the roads, it's not like in the Alps where you have big trucks and big cars all the time, you know, passing by. So you're pretty much alone, which is really cool. Usually the weather is good. Um, it's a little bit different also for, for flying because it doesn't start before 12 or 1. You know, in the Alps sometimes on the east face, you would expect to take off at 9.30, 10. It's not happening in the Pyrenees. Maybe someone proved me wrong, but it's it's kind of hard to take off early in the Pyrenees, which gives you some time in the morning to cover some distance. And uh, yeah, and also you have what I like in the Pyrenees that you have the um, um, how do you call that uh, Camino de Santiago, which is like you have lots of people crossing the Pyrenees, walking to Santiago de Compostela, and uh, it's really cool. You meet a lot of interesting people, so that's quite that's quite nice too. Um, but yeah, more than anything else, nature is amazing, and it's really wild, which I, I like a lot. And you can find water most of the time, a little bit everywhere, so you don't need to really search for water. It's it's kind of easy to find. But still, when you're going to climb a mountain, you should take at least a liter and a half, two liters of water because uh, it can be really hot. I had days of 35 uh, degrees, like really stable days where <laughs> I was dying, you know. A mountain is nothing really technical, nothing really dangerous. It's not like high mountains in the Alps. So, and you can find takeoff and landing almost everywhere in the mountains. And what I was pilots coming from the X-Alps, they've been performing in the X-Alps for many years now, in the Red Bull X-Alps. They've been, uh, they know all the area, they know all the mountains, they know a little bit of everything about it. And then they come to the Pyrenees and it's, uh, you know, it's all new for them. Uh, the flying is different, the mountains are different, the roads, the everything, you know. I mean, I, it was not a mistake, but when I arrived in the in the Pyrenees, I thought, okay, I'm just, at the beginning, I wanted to do it as, uh, as smooth as possible, like I was on holidays, but then I couldn't stop um, trying to keep the Red Bull X out straight, you know, and so at the beginning, the first day, I think I walked 55 kilometers or something, second day, pretty much the same, I was walking like hell, and uh, I was way heavier than than in the exiles because I had to carry my sleeping bag, I had my mattress, I had all the instruments, the gloves and everything. In the exiles or in the XP, you can only you don't you only have to carry your minimum flying equipment. But when you do bivouac flying, um vol beef, basically you have to carry everything else. You know, you have your your gear, you have your food, you have everything. Uh, I have was I wasn't supported. So my backpack, I think altogether was around 13 to 14 kilos, which is not really heavy. It's quite good. I was flying the Aspen 4, a light version. I was flying the Super X-13, uh, which is a XA-13, which is a really cool harness. It's only 1.5 kilos. I had a rescue parachute and then the instruments and everything, you know, but altogether with water and things, it was not less than 14 kilos, which is totally manageable. But uh, now I'm I'm getting ready for the next big uh, vol bivouac, and I'm I'm going to be under nine kilos probably, so that would be easier. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll see. But then you know the Pyrenees, which is cool, is that it's wild, but at the same time I had a very little GPS, you know, and I had everything on it, all the little tracks, all the. It was super easy to navigate in there, you know. You can get lost, of course, if you don't have it, but as soon as you have a little bit of technology with you. It's quite easy. I was not using maps. I think the best, um, for me, the best part of the crossing of the Pyrenees was um, for sure the Monte Perdido area. I had to go around, you know, because there's the national park, so you have to go south and flying around the, the national park, but the view was breathtaking. It was really, it was a brilliant flight. And at the end of the flight, I, fl I landed just at the bottom of the Cotiela, um, which is a really cool mountain. I couldn't make it to the other side because the, 
the cloud base was pretty low that day, and I landed just next to the to the swimming pool of the of the town. <laughs> so yeah, that was perfect. I had like a four or five hours flight, running up the mountain, flying, you know, landing, running up the mountain again, flying. It took me a long time to cover some distance, and then I landed just next to the swimming pool, jumped in, and then that night I I think I slept in the mountain things again and uh, that was that was really perfect i had really good moments during the pyrenees i mean the people are so so nice here like they will welcome you you know i i landed almost by night in Sort one day and the friend just uh i mean someone from down you know a pilot local pilot just came and invited me to his place and we shared some dinner and so that's that's a cool thing about the uh, vol you know you get to meet people interesting people in the mountains and that was that was very nice i mean and for me for sure, the best, the very best moment was when I saw the Mediterranean Sea, because at the beginning of the trip, you know, you climb to Pico de Ori, and from there you can see all the Pyrenees, and it's a long way. You know, <laughs> let me tell you, it's a long distance. You see all those peaks one after the other. Is that you have the vultures, all the big birds there, to tell you if it's flyable or not. So, as long as they're not flying, you shouldn't be flying. So basically, you climb in the morning. You try to do it when it's not too warm, not too hot. You climb in the morning on the top, and then you wait for the birds to fly. And when they start flying, you know you can go, and they will show you in every terminal on the way. You will see some birds, so that's that's quite cool to fly with big vultures. Also, that was really interesting. The worst part for sure was walking from Besalu to to the sea. It's flat and straight. You have this road that is maybe 20 kilometers long, straight line. You can see very far away the big trucks coming you know and they're coming and they are coming they're coming and they did they take hours to get to you you know this very long road was a nightmare it was horrible um i really hope someone can fly to the sea i'm i'm thinking it's possible maybe going up north a little bit you know on a good day it should be possible to fly to the sea i'm really looking forward to see what Kriegel and one Thomas Coconea and Aaron Drogati and those guys will do uh, if they have good conditions, that's going to be really interesting to follow. You know, this this race is really now people are pushing. There's a very high level, and uh, that's and I'm really looking forward to see what they do. Yeah, I was my my uh, idea was to do it without support, but I mean, it doesn't really mean anything because at the end you you can buy. I mean, I was going with my credit card and I could buy food. In, in town, you know, or I was going to, to the little shops and buying food and I had my phone with me. So I had kind of a good support from the locals and uh, also from the organizer of, of the XP, you know, from Inigo. He was calling me every, almost every day or sending me WhatsApp to tell me what was the weather, what was the wind like. I had some good advices from Claudio Eidel also, uh, from Inigo Gaviria and those guys, you know, they were really helping. So that was really cool. I had Ramon Morias many times on the phone. So, and, but, but yeah, I was doing it without support. I had no one on the ground and uh, it makes a difference because sometimes you get uh, a little bit lost. You're not sure where to go next or things like that, you know, so that makes the whole adventure a little bit more uh, interesting. Every every flight in the Pyrenees is a good flight, you know, even if you fly only 20, 25 kilometers. Some days it was just surviving along the peaks, you know, like trying to climb, but it was not, it was very stable. Um, but I had I have very good memories of uh, flying near uh, Monte Perdido. The view was breathtaking. It was just going around the national park. That was amazing. And really technical flight with a lot of wind. And, you know, those kind of flights where you take off in the morning, you think, ah, I'm not going to do any distance. And then at the end of the day, you land 70 kilometers further, which was really cool, even if it's small distance. There's one flight that was really risky. Uh, I flew from Pic de Lori down to La Seu, and I had to land on the way, and I took off in a lee side somewhere that was totally crazy um i was i was glad i was flying a sea glider you know the aspen 4 is very stable in in strong turbulences so i could handle it but i think with a competition glider it probably would have been a rescue parachute maybe <laughs> that was crazy it went in every direction i got half twisted the worst day also was when i had to walk from la Seu to la molina 
It was 50 kilometer or something, maybe a little bit more. It was super hot, but very, very stable. No, no chance to fly and a lot of, uh, a lot of wind um, high in altitude. So that was walking on high, like main roads. And that's a little bit horrible. If I had to do it again, I don't think I would do it alone because, I mean, it's always cool to to be by yourself, but after two weeks, <laughs> I was starting to speak to myself. I was getting a little bit nuts, you know. So um, I remember when we crossed uh, New Zealand with Erdi, you know, we, we traveled for 26 days through 900 kilometers of mountains with Ferdi, Ferdinand van Schelven from, the, from Holland. He's a really good friend. And at the end, you know, all those uh, good memories you keep, you know, when you do it with someone, it's really worth uh, the you know doing it with with a friend of yours and just sharing the good moments and the bad moments. Um, I think it's also way uh, much safer. You know, when you fly alone and you're flying really close to the peaks, you didn't sleep much. You've been sleeping in your glider or you know you're tired. Um, it would be cool to have someone, you know, just looking for you, looking up, um, looking for you that everything is okay. You're not taking too many risks. You're not flying too dangerously. Um, so that's what I thought. When I, when I finished, I thought, eh, if I had to do it again, I'll do it with a friend. Just because it's about sharing, you know, that would be more fun, I guess. I'd like to do it again, you know, I, I think I will come to the Pyrenees again. Um, I'm actually thinking to go on bivouac flight next week here, maybe from Castejón de Sos back to Organia or something like that, because I'm training in Organia right now. Um, but wait for the, be the really good weather and really get into the high mountains. Uh, yeah, I mean, when when I arrived to to Pico de Ori, that was a beautiful. Like coming to Pico de Ori was really nice to climb there, and I went through France. Actually, I was in France in Saint Jean uh, Saint Jean Pied de Port, and uh, that was quite a cool city to cross. You know, lots of cool people there and um, lots of travelers. And then getting into the mountains was really nice. I think for me. One of the area I liked the most was, yeah, again, you know, Monte Perdido and also walking around the Cotilla and going down to Castejón de Sos. I was really hoping to get good weather condition in Castejón. It's, it was not happening. Normally, it's a super cool place to fly. And um, that was nice because I, I was flying with a friend that day. We covered a little bit of distance together. It's cool when you arrive in Castejón and you meet other pilots and you're like, ah, okay, that's where you were, <laughs> you stayed, you know, like... I had been searching for paragliding pilots for the whole trip, and when I arrived in Castejón, suddenly lots of people flying and trying to cover distance, and so that was really, really cool to be again with people in the sky, you know. But uh, yeah, Castejón de Sos is, is kind of a great place to fly. And then I had surprises, like you're walking and you look at the GPS and you're like, oh, I'm, maybe I tried to reach this village or this city, you know, to try to spend the night in some places, maybe someone isn't going to inviting me to his place and when I arrived to Besalu uh, it's a medieval city you know and it's amazing and it, you when you look when you see it on the map you think okay it's gonna be like any cool Spanish city that's it you know but then you arrive like a huge um, middle age you know like a uh, town from the middle age you know like a uh, medieval town that was beautiful it was really nice to also <laughs> the cultural you know side of uh, crossing the Pyrenees it's not only about sport you know and And I think those 250 kilometers that you have of big mountains, you know, um, it's possible to fly, you know, for sure. I mean, uh, good pilots would be able to fly 150, 200 kilometers, no problem. It's doable, you know. Uh, the problem is that you don't have so many hours. You, you start at one and, uh, I mean, you can fly late in the evening, but, but still. Uh, but in seven, six, seven hours, you can cover this distance, you know, you can go. So I would like to, to do that one day, fly 150, 200 k's in the Pyrenees, that would be really nice. A few things you really have to take care of in the Pyrenees, uh, first of all, because it's really hot. A lot of drinking, you have to drink a lot if you're going to be covering lots of kilometers, you have to drink a lot, you have to eat well, of course, you have to rest the, the hours you need, you know, that's for sure the basic. But also you have to change a little bit your type of flying in terms of, you know, many times when I was flying there, would just not make it above the mountain, so it's no problem. You just land there, you don't try to search for trommel and go all the way down to the valley. You land there, 
put your glider on your back, climb back up. It's going to be 100 meter or 200 meter, whatever, you know, take off again and keep on going. And like this, you can cover kilometers. You have to stay high. And also, because the flying doesn't start before 12 or 1, you can use the time you have in the morning to cover distance on the ground. So, and, and every kilometer is good to take. So if you can cover 10, 15, 20 kilometers in the morning and then climb a mountain, I would do it. Uh, if you're not sure about the weather, because uh, you have time, you know, and then it starts and try to stay as much as possible. Look out, watch out uh, for thunderstorm because the Pyrenees, it develops so fast and that I really, it's important, it's an important point. You have to be really careful with that. When clouds get big here, it gets, it transforms really fast in a thunderstorm. So don't play too much, you know, don't take risk. Um, if you see big clouds, just uh, try to avoid it, go around, whatever, but uh, try to be safe with that. And um, I would also always take a little bit of, don't always count on the supporters, because the access can be really difficult. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't think like in the Alps, okay, no problem, I land and I have my supporter 20 minutes later just uh, with me. That's probably not going to happen all the time. The Pyrenees are way more difficult to navigate with the car. So um, take a little bit of food, take what you need to be able to cover some distance for a few hours, um, waiting for your supporter in a in point where they will be able to find you. So that's, that's, that would be my advice. Just, yeah, enjoy it. I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about enjoying it. Um, to keep the motivation alive, it's uh, to try to enjoy, to have a good time. Um, of course, it's a competition and you should uh, give your best. But uh, try to have a good time in the Pyrenees. It's really an enjoyable place. So, yeah. Well, um, I mean, I totally felt in love with the Pyrenees. I'd like to come back here. Um, pretty soon I will do some Val Bivouac for sure because it's, it's really a great place. But now the next one I'm preparing, I'm working on, is to go around the Adriatic Circle with Paul Guschelbauer. So basically, um, the Adriatic Sea, you know, on the east of, uh, in between Italy and, and Croatia and Greece and all that. Well, we're going to live from Ancona in Italy, cross the Apennine mountains, um, through all the way to Genoa, then from Genoa to Mont Blanc, go all around the Alps um, in the other direction of the Red Bull Lakes Alps, you know, doing everything in the other direction, all the way to, um, to Slovenia and then down to Croatia. And once in Zadar, we will be in Croatia, just in front of uh, Ancona, where we started. And there the idea is to pick up paramotors. So I'm working now with HNA paramotors to build a paramotor that is able to fly 200 kilometers ab above water. And we will fly with paramotors 200 kilometers above water back to the starting point. So altogether, it's almost 2,000 kilometers. <laughs> it's a long way. And we do it without support. We are only two pilots. So that's going to be an exciting one. But it's not a race. I mean, we, we're going to try to push as much as possible, do it fast. You know, we, we are looking at the time. But uh, we're not racing against guys like uh, Tomako Konea or Kegel Moller. So <laughs> hopefully it's going to be intense. But also in long distance like that, you have to survive all the way, you know. So we're going to push uh, as fast as possible, but um, not in a racing mode, hopefully. to all the pilots I mean I'm, I'm sure that one day I will take part it's if it was not for this project I have this year I would be with you guys uh, trying to win this competition for sure because um, yeah now that I know a little bit the place I think uh, yeah that would be a really nice race to do to take part in so maybe probably next year and in two years I'll probably be there for sure that's gonna be really interesting to watch and to follow on the website and see what those guys are going to do, which decision they're going to take um, without knowing anything about the place. So that's, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm surely going to be following for sure. And now uh, I want to see who is going to be first <laughs> at the sea. That's, uh, that's an interesting one. I mean, and that can be really fast if they have good weather, but that will be slow if they don't because you cannot walk straight in the valley. You know?